how many cores do you want in your CPU? How many cores do you want in your GPU? Well, I just got back from AMD's data center and AI technology premiere, where they put cores in your cores. Let's go through what they announced. A lot of the content on this channel wouldn't be possible without you, the supporters. Many thanks to all who support, and you, if you're interested in supporting, then we have Patreon, we have a merch store, I have a Substack newsletter, or simply just like and subscribe. It really does help out the channel. So at the event, there were two main headlines, one for CPU and one for AI Accelerator. They went in that order, so let's do that ourselves. Start with Zen 4, or in this case, Zen 4C. Zen 4C was the big announcement of the event, and it's uh, Zen 4, but for cloud. That's where the C comes from. Now, why would that, why would a core for the cloud be any different? Well, it turns out that cloud workloads, like lots, having lots of cores, are very good performance at better efficiency than most desktop or enterprise class cores run at. So AMD designed the Zen 4C to meet their demand. Now, people are already saying, well, hang on, isn't this AMD's version of an E-Core, a more energy efficient core? And I'd say yes, but no. The difference between what uh, AMD is doing, what Intel is doing, is that Zen 4 and Zen 4C, Zen 4C are practically, microarchitecturally identical, except in one circumstance, and that's the L3 cache. Instead of having four megs of L3 per core, you only have two megs of L3 for co per core. Everything else, all the instructions, all the timing, all the latencies are identical. With the competitor's P&E cores, that's not the same. You'll have a mi mismatch of instructions. Some can support one, some can support the other. Um, what AMD is trying to do here is basically say to any customer who wants this uh, new Zen 4C core, if you've got a workload that runs on Zen 4, you're going to get the same performance out of Zen 4C. Now, okay, yes, there's a little bit of a cache mismatch, but in most use cases, the IPC uh, is identical for most workloads. You get a higher energy efficiency because this thing is targeted at slightly lower frequencies. Um, but you can pack more into a CPU. And part of the reason they were able to do that is due to the core area. Now, a standard Zen 4 core runs at about 3.85 square millimeters. That's the core plus the L2 cache area. With, uh, with Zen 4C, this goes down to about 2.5 square millimeters. So they're essentially saying a 35% reduction in the core area. And in certain parts of the core, that's as much as 50%. And yet they've managed to keep exactly the same architecture, exact same instructions and exactly the same latency. How have they managed to do this? Well, it all comes down to physical design. When you design a core, you'll have a PDK from uh, the foundry and you'll design based on what you want the power to be, what you want the frequency to be, and everything else in between. There's also cost, die area, it's what we call PPAC. With the standard Zen 4 cores, those cores have to go in from everything from embedded all the way up to the high performance uh, consumer cores. This is why when they, when they built it, this has to go up to you know, 5.5, 5.7, 6 gigahertz frequency. With the Zen 4C core, what they turned around and said, well, we only need it to go up to say 3.1 gigahertz, and we'll see that in the uh, in the chips. We need to go 3.1 gigahertz. So what can we do to optimize for that frequency? And it turns out that you can make structures a lot smaller because you don't have to worry about interference of high frequency, whether that's power, electrical, or, or logical, or what have you. And this enables you to build structures within your core a lot smaller. Now, AMD has said here that if you were to scale their Zen 4C core up to say four, five, six gigahertz, it would be less efficient and it might not even work. So what th this means is that when you've got guardrails on your design and you know you're not going to go above 3.1 gigahertz, you can essentially take advantage of lots of space saving, save lots of die area, and ultimately increase the density of your core count inside your chips. Now these cores, their first product they're going into is called Bergamo or Bergamo or Dom who's editing this video probably is going to shout at me because he's Italian and I can't pronounce it properly. But Bergamo. This is the cloud version of Epic Genoa, but instead of Zen 4, we've got Zen 4C cores. Instead of 96 cores, we've got 128 cores that support multi-threading, so 256 cores. And instead of having 12 chiplets here, we have eight chiplets. Instead of the chiplets each having eight cores, we have chiplets with 16 cores. Now, if you remember back, we used to have two CCXs per core. This is the same thing here, except each CCX is eight cores, 
and you have two CCXs per chiplet, and then you have eight chiplets, and that's how you get the cores. On screen, I'm showing the SKU list right now. We've got the 128 core version with 256 threads. Uh, there's the 128 core without uh, simultaneous multi-threading uh, as an option at all. Uh, this is a really weird SKU, but we'll get to that in a second. And then there's the 120, 112 core version with 224 threads. As you can see, uh, the power 320, 360 watts, uh, all support 12 channels of DDR5 4800, all support 128 PCI lanes, uh, and all have the same amount of uh, L3 cache here. You can see a difference in the prices as well. The top end Biogamo is roughly the same cost as the top end Genoa. Now that chip in the middle, one without simultaneous multi-threading, why does that exist? Surely you can take that top end SKU and just disable multi-threading in the BIOS. Well, you can. However, what we're seeing now in the cloud, uh, cloud instances are sold to customers based on vCPUs, and that's just another way of saying threads. And as a result of having all, this, uh, all these cores with simultaneous multi-threading, it means that you have a variability in your performance based on the cloud instance you provide. The cloud providers are now starting to give instances where one vCPU is actually equal to one CPU. And they do this through disabling the multi-threading or buying chips without multi-threading enabled. That chip is for those customers. It also helps a little bit with the validation on AMD side. That's why there's a, a small cost decrease as well. In terms of performance with certain workloads, AMD provided a variety against what uh, Intel is showcasing with their Sapphire Rapids platform. And we're seeing you know, a 2.7 to 2.9x improvement based on AMD's workloads. Obviously, we're going to have to wait for reviews to come out and confirm that. But the key point here is that you can have your core density, you can have it at a highly efficient power point, and you can essentially have density in your data center. But that's really what Bogamo is going after. If it's in the same SP5 socket, uh, I hopefully I'm going to get some into test as well, either offer some in the cloud or some to actually put in my system behind me. And uh, we'll see how that goes, and we'll see how fast Cinebench runs too. The other CPU announcement was Genoa X. This is the vCache enabled version of Genoa, the mainline Epic uh, CPU. So we already had this in the previous ge generation. Milan goes to Milan X, where each, uh, each of the core chiplets gets an extra 64 megabytes of L3 cache. Same thing here with Genoa X. You've got up to 96 cores. 1.152 gigabytes of L3 cache across the whole chip. Now these are designed for technical computing. We're talking about computational fluid dynamics, um, uh, EDA tools, so electronic design automation, basically any workload where ha having the most amount of L3 cache per core is important. And as, uh, as with Bergamo, there are gonna be three SKUs here. And again, these SKUs are a little bit weird. We've got the top of the line 96 core part, 192 threads with that 1.1 gigabytes of L3 cache. Again, 12 channels of DDR5 4800, again, 120 PCI lanes, 400 watts, and there's a pretty uh, you know, expensive price to match. After the 96 core, we come down to the 32 core. So there's no 64 core here, version here at all. Now the 32 core only has eight chiplets, not 12. So you do lose some of that L3 cache, but it's still three times more than you'd get if you bought the non-V cache version. And then there's an, even a 16 core one. Now the 16 core one's interesting because it still has eight chiplet. So that's two cores per chiplet, or basically 48 megabytes of L3 cache per core. And for some workloads, that's gonna be absolutely vital in order to get the most performance, even with the additional latency of going across the Infinity Fabric to the IO die um, between the cores, just because each core needs so much cache. Uh, these, again, are also SP5 enabled, so they're gonna fit into the standard Epic uh, sockets. And again, I've got oh, another one of these chips coming in, so we'll put them in the system and see how that goes. If we look at the benchmark comparisons, then AMD pitted its 32 core against Intel's 32 core mainstream part. It's not comparing against the HBM part because Intel HBM is specifically for HPC, not for technical computing. In this instance, AMD showcased a 1.5x speed up in computational fluid dynamics and finite element analysis. If we move that to the top of the stack, AMD is promoting a 2.2x on average speed up, which is quite handy. And then the final bit of the day is what we were actually all waiting for. AMD has been talking up its AI game uh, but today it really hasn't you know, pushed its AI credentials. That's because the current chip on the market for Radeon Instinct is the MI250X. Very good for HPC, 
not really showcasing much AI in, in that chip. But the new MI300 generation is meant to kind of bring about both HPC and I for AMD. From my side of the fence, MI300 has always been seen as a, as a HPC part for high performance computing for supercomputers, just like uh, MI250X. It's only recently AMD's been talking about it in an AI context. And what we were expecting at this event is a deeper dive into that cDNA3 architecture, the compute's DNA architecture. We didn't get that, which was kind of um, surprising, kind of disappointing. And I think the markets at the time kind of reflected that. However, what we did get shown was that the MI300A, A standing for APU in this case, that was announced back at CES, uh, we got more of an indication of the, um, of the SKU that's going to come out from that. So MI300A, A for APU, so it means it's going to have CPU cores and GPU cores. It's going to have 24 Zen 4 cores, and then the rest of the chiplets are essentially GPU cores, and then 128 gigabytes of HBM3 memory. Now I'm going to show up a diagram here and I'm going to showcase some of the important chiplet factors that we have. So in order to get 24 Zen 4 cores, we need three 8 core chiplets and that's in that quadrant there in the bottom right. There are three other quadrants which have the GPU chiplets and that's going to have six GPU chiplets there, two for each quadrant. So while the GPU or compute chiplets have two per quadrant, the compute chiplets have three. And underneath each quadrant, we believe, is an active interposer, and that's managing all the connectivity between the die. Now, for this part, AMD has said that it's already sampling, but it's not actually going to ramp till Q4 later this year, which is a longer time to ex than expected. And AMD seem to be really targeting this one specifically to the HPC space. If we pivot to a new version that they announced at the event, this is the MI300X. So remember those three CPU chiplets we saw in the A? Take those out and place them with two GPU chiplets for the X. So it's purely compute, it purely looks like an accelerator. Now we have up to 192 HBM3 memory, 5.2 terabytes per second of memory bandwidth. And that's kind of all the other information that we got. Well, 153 billion transistors, which is a lot. Uh, and to have all these chiplets and advanced patching, that's great. AMD didn't really say much about the AI capabilities of, of this uh, processor. They said it's going to be good for large language models. And why is it going to be good for large language models? Well, 192 gigabytes of HBM3 compared to the 80 or 96 that you can get on NVIDIA right now. Part of the problem with these large modules is scaling out to multiple devices. If you can keep as much on one chip as you can in terms of memory, that means you don't lose the excess from having to split up your workload across multiple GPUs. That being said, this is a chiplet-based design, so it's going to be interesting to see how the cross-communication between the chiplets happens. We're expecting an AI data center day. Um, we're expecting it to be this one, but we're going to expect one later in the year uh, to get more into the details of what AI number formats are supported uh, and what models and uh, what frameworks are going to be used. AMD did have PyTorch and Hugging Face up on, up on stage at the event, so uh, that looks like the obvious direction in which they're going to go. The MI300X uh, sampling to customers in Q3, and then again, ramping Q4, so we perhaps won't see it hit the balance sheet more until Q1, Q2. And uh, between the A, between the X, uh, we're starting to hear about customers who are going to be getting it in the first half of next year. Now, I'm a little disappointed we didn't have a deep dive into the architecture. Yeah, it, that, that's kind of what most people were expecting out of this event, and that didn't happen. Um, AMD knows so much, I've told them, other people have told them. Uh, so they know what we're expecting later in the year. We're just going to have to wait for that event to turn up. And uh, the minute it does, you'll find out about it on this channel. At the event, AMD also mentioned some of its Pensando stuff for SmartNICs and uh, DPUs, though that wasn't particularly the highlight. Uh, no mention of sort of uh, Xilinx's AI engine, although Alveo did, ha did show up in parts. But I think now that uh, AMD has essentially created an AI group under Victor Peng, who is essentially the head of Xilinx, there's going to be a renewed focus towards machine learning hardware going forward. The question is going to be, how well can they support the software ecosystem? It's been a bit of a pain point for people using Rockham right now. I mean, yes, it's supported in supercomputing centers and they can grab it by the horns, though it does need some form of wide adoptability 
uh, outside of that ecosystem. So again, tabs on later this year, early next year, and we have to see what the competition comes out with.